Blessings in the name of the Lord Jesus. Welcome to Paraclet TV, making disciples through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our intended learning outcome, at the end of this session, 100% of the students with 100% level of proficiency will be able to discuss Brunner's Constructivist Theory. It is very obvious from this uh, intended learning outcome or lesson objective that will be able to introduce to you another theorist and that is Brunner and of course how uh, his contribution to the, to the educational system has improved the facilitating of the teaching and learning process. First, who is this Brunner? His full name is Jerome Seymour Brunner. And he is an American psychologist and uh, he is very uh, famous on his contributions to human cognitive psychology. And he is very famous of his cognitive learning. And uh, this uh, Jerome Bruner is a senior research fellow at the New York University School of Law. He was born on October 1, 1915 in New York, New York, United States and died June 5, 2016 at Manhattan, New York, United States. His education, uh, he garnered his, uh, his uh, degrees at Harvard University in 1941 as well as in Duke University in 1937. From his theory, we will be learning five important concepts. We have a spiral curriculum, we have representation of knowledge, we have theory of instruction, discovery learning, and categorization. So we will be discussing it one by one as we go on. So let us start from the theory statement of constructivist uh, theory by Brunner. And according to this uh, constructivist theory, learning is an active process in which learners construct new ideas or concepts based on their current and past knowledge. So uh, according to Brunner, learning must be an active process wherein when the teacher is developing a lesson, the students must also be active in listening, be active in processing the information that is being uh, shared by his teacher or by his instructor and while he is uh, receiving new information or new learnings from the teacher he will begin to construct uh, new ideas uh, based from what is being presented and being developed by the teacher and uh, he can of course based from the theory he can of course uh, develop new concepts or new ideas from what is being shared and developed by the teachers because these ideas and these concepts that are being uh, developed by the students based from what is being developed by the teacher must be based in their current and past knowledge. So it is very important that the teacher must satisfy uh, the so-called uh, the law or the principle of starts where the students are. It is very important that we teachers must know our students what are the things that they have already know and what are the things that we have to improve further. Uh, the first concept that we'll be learning from this theory is called representation. And when we speak about representation, there are three stages of representation. The first one is inactive representation. What is inactive representation? It is when learning occurs through action and the outcomes of their actions. And learning happens when the students act and, uh, and he will also learn from the consequences of the, or the out outcomes of their actions. It also in this uh, manner that in an active representation, it will, of course, represent objects and the immediate sensation of them. And when uh, a teacher will uh, show an object to a pupil or to the pupils, the, of course, the pupil will sense what that object is and he will begin to imagine if that object is pres 
present not only in the school but of course if they have touched that in the house or a, if they have seen that in the television and uh, in an active representation there is also the, the needs of muscles and uh, involvement of motor responses and of course how they manipulate the environment so um, not only they will see the object or the things that are being presented by the teacher but of course uh, they will think that if they have already touched that or if they have already uh, experienced to play that object or to manipulate that object one example in an active representation uh, in of course in preschool or as well as in elementary are the numbers represented by blocks or say for example of course when they see puzzles or uh, drawings that are um, that are posted in the bulletin boards of the teacher next after uh, an active representation we have also the second which is called iconic representation iconic representation happens when learning is obtained through you using models and pictures so this is now very important that uh, the use and the utilization of models or models and pictures are very important the use of them is very important in the teaching in the learning process learning uh, happens when the students will use their mental images to stand for certain objects or events so we experienced in our uh, schooling when we were in elementary and you uh, as well as in high school you have uh, experienced to be uh, seeing different images different models that are exposed or that are displayed in our classrooms and even these uh, models are being shown to us by the teachers to emphasize the competencies and the skills that we must understand and of course example of these are the flash cards these are the plus cards of course will show us models i will show us letters or even numbers and then uh, in elementary of course this is very important now and when you you are in the high school you will see uh, pictures that are presented say for example you are studying about the history of a certain place they will show you a picture or uh, now that are we are in the in the social media uh, we will see that there are many moving pictures that we will find especially in YouTubes or even in other platforms and uh, of course the third one of the types of representation we have the symbolic representation so please remember that uh, representation have three stages the first stage which is the lowest stage is called an active representation it, it is being followed by a iconic representation and the third is called the symbolic representation now in symbolic representation the students now are being taught uh, to have an ability to think in abstract terms the most common symbols that are being used in symbolic representation are language and mathematical notation so it is very important that the, that the teachers will really use uh, his communication, oral communication in teaching or in instruction. It, it must be very clear to the students. And uh, in a mathematical notation, of course, these are also symbols that uh, have meanings. Say, for example, a formula. How are they going to use a certain formula? and uh, when they see this formula it is an example of symbolic representation and one also example when when we ask our students to handle objects uh, with numbers and of course number signs you no know, in blocks or even in cardboards or even if they will really see uh, them posted in front of them you no know, at the top of the green board we usually see them and uh, and according to Brunner, teachers to facilitate learning must bring concrete objects, pictorial, and then symbolic activities. So these three uh, must be used by the teachers. They have to really show them, really to present 
the discussion or the development of the lesson by first using an active representation and then by iconic representation until they will really understand the so-called symbolic representation because children uh, one best example is children before they learn mathematical operations they have to first show numbers to them whether it is in blocks whether it is in cardboards and then after showing to them the numbers they will of course uh, you have to really back up it with pictures now wherein the the numbers are written there until they will really uh, understand and comprehend number concepts the next important term in the in the constructivist theory by Brunner is the so-called spiral curriculum or spiral method uh, what is this spiral curriculum it is translating information to be learned into a format appropriate to the learners current state of understanding because we have to remember that the pupils in the preschool have different or we can say low current state of understanding as compared to an elementary pupils and then elementary pupils compared to high school students are of course have different current states of understanding so this is very important that in the spiral curriculum you must understand and diagnose what is the current state of understanding of the learner in the spiral curriculum curriculum must be organized in a spiral manner so that students continually builds up on what they have already learned so what they have already learned in grade one or in first year based from that current state of learning the second year teacher or even the second grade two teacher will of course uh, give them a new information which is of course a continuation a spiral continuation or a spiral to the previous knowledge that they have already gained Teachers must revisit the curriculum by teaching the same content in different ways depending on the student's developmental levels. So the uh, law of review, uh, the law of uh, assessment, as well as we call that as diagnostic assessment must be conducted by the teachers in order for them to really uh, be scientific and objective of the state of understanding of the students before they are going to present new knowledge in the philippines in the k-12 curriculum the spiral progression is a mandate from the enhanced basic education curriculum development of the republic act 10533 in 2013 and the curriculum and in uh, from this uh, republic act the curriculum shall use the spiral progression approach to ensure mastery of knowledge and skills after each level. Say, for example, in mathematics, we have mathematics, algebra, geometry, and trigonometry concepts that are taught from kindergarten to grade 10. Okay, so meaning uh, a kindergarten then you have the grade one grade two grade three grade four up to grade 10 they will have a taste a progression of what is being taught in mathematics in algebra geometry and, uh, and of course in trigonometry one example is when you are when you are a science teacher and you are handing grade seven then up to grade 10 now, say for example, in grade 7, you will be teaching about that your concept is about matter. And in grade 7, you will be teaching about diversity of mathematics. In grade 8, you will be teaching them particulate nature of matter vis-a-vis. -vis. And then in grade 9, you will be having a progression, chemical bonding, metallic, ionic, and covalent. And in grade 10, you have kinetic molecular theory. Another example in matter, in grade 7, you will, when you are teaching about properties of solutions which are homogeneous mixtures, 
Then in grade 8, relative to this, an increase or a progression about atomic structure, atoms, and molecules. And then in grade 9, another progression, which is chemical formula of ionic and covalent compounds and gas laws and their application. So you will see that uh, there is an increase or a progression of the different concepts that are being taught by the teacher in different levels uh, because they are considering the nature of what the students have already known before they will proceed with a higher learning. There are, of course, according to Brunner, there are uh, three principles of instruction under a spiral curriculum. First, instruction must be concerned with experiences and complex that may the student willing and able to learn. So this is a very important thing that you must remember as one of the principles of instruction in a spiral curriculum and it is about readiness. So you have learned about the law of readiness in our previous discussion and uh, this is about Thorndike. Now the theories is Thorndike, the law of readiness that because when the students is not ready for uh, a concept for a new learning, he will never learn it. So it is very important that uh, the role of motivation, the role of assessment, diagnostic or diagnosis, you have to really uh, make use of them in order for the students to know their current status and start to provide for a new learning. And then the students now are ready for the new learning. Second principle, instruction must be structured so that it can be easily grasped by the student structure we say that uh, you have already a plan example is the curriculum prepared curriculum or uh, in the basic education or in uh, in the department of education they have the so-called uh, completed learning competencies and uh, the, from the learning competencies the teacher will be able to look into the, the skills that must be developed in hierarchy uh, first will be the lowest uh, skill which is a prerequisite for a higher skill in the same within a competency in a competency you have to really prepare for a lower than to proceed with a higher competency. We call that as a spiral organization. And the third is instruction should be designed to facilitate extrapolation or fill in the gaps, meaning there is a need of going beyond the information given. We have to teach our students to think more than what they are uh, listening more than what they are seeing and they have to apply it in their uh, real life in, a, in an actual life scenario and um, because what we are teaching within the four corners of the room must of course be uh, applied or must be experienced by our students in a real life scenario and uh, when they do that they will of course go beyond they will, of course, go beyond what is being taught and what is uh, being developed by the teachers to them. What they are hearing, what they are seeing inside the classroom must, of course, be experienced outside the classroom. So, therefore, the teacher must, of course, bring the outside, the experiences of the students outside within the classroom. Meaning, when they give examples, they have to really... Uh, look at the experiences, common experiences, say for example of a grade 1 student or what are the uh, favorite uh, programs in the television of, of uh, high school students, something like that. And you have to really bring that inside the classroom, especially when you are developing a concept and by giving them illustration, by give them, giving them examples that students have experienced in their real life scenario. The third concept under constructivist theory is discovery learning. What is discovery learning? It is obtaining knowledge you know, for oneself based from what the teacher is presenting to them. Because when you have 10 students, while you are uh, teaching, students of 10 will have different 
uh, uh, processing of the information that you are giving them uh, because of so many factors and uh, and uh, there are students who are very exposed to some top some uh, some information there are students who are not that exposed so based from what they are experiencing in their personal life they will be able that's that that's the that's the basis of how they will obtain knowledge from what the teacher is presenting to them that the duty of the teacher is to plan and arrange activities in such a way that the students can search manipulate explore and investigate under the, under the discovery learning we have to uh, learn about the four major aspects of the theory of instruction according to Brunner first one the predisposition to learn again readiness for learning is very important any stage of development in a way that fits the child's cognitive abilities they must be prepared so we as teachers we have to be sure that pupils are ready for a higher learning second aspects of the theory of instruction the structure of knowledge a structure of knowledge is a body of knowledge that must be structured for readily grasped by the learner so when we say structured, they are already there. They are already planned, formally uh, uh, constructed and organized by a group of experts. Say, for example, in a curriculum or even in the prescribed uh, competencies and skills that each level must acquire. Structure means the relationship among factual elements and techniques and, and uh, with regards to the structure of knowledge you have to remember the following details the first detail is about categorization what is categorization categorization is considered in the structure of knowledge as a fundamental process Meaning you have to categorize the concept, you have to categorize the subconcept, you have to categorize the different information or facts that you're going to present to your students. Details are better retained within the context of order and structured pattern. Uh, accord, this, according to Brunner, this structured pattern is about the spiral progression. Relative to the details of a structure of knowledge, it is very important to generate knowledge which is transferable to other contexts. Meaning when you give uh, information about global warming, you will not only discuss global warming in the local scenario, in your place, but of course you have to mention about what is happening in the national uh, area or even in the global scenario of about global warming. It is also important to know the principle of orientation. Principle of orientation is the discrepancy between beginning and advanced knowledge in the subject area. And it has to be diminished. The gap must be diminished. Say, for example, what was learned in grade 1 mathematics and what is being learned in grade 2 mathematics, you have to really... Uh, use the principle of orientation by looking at the gap before you introduce a new lesson the gap must all must be discovered or must be assessed it must be recognizable to students experiences so not only with his experiences but of course in his behavior in his performance within the classroom very uh, you will really see uh, what are the things that they've already mastered? What are the things to improve? Or what are the knowledge that seems that they don't really know or zero knowledge about that thing? Third, about the four major aspects of the theory of instruction, uh, we have already discussed about predisposition to learn. Second, structure of knowledge. Then third, we have effective sequencing 
the lesson must be presented in increasing difficulty. And so from here, uh, your lesson must start with uh, the, the simplest, then you will promote the information to uh, a higher degree, then it will be going to another level and then to the topmost part of the information. We call that again as a spiral curriculum. It's very appropriate for this uh, major aspect of the theory of in instruction which is called effective sequencing. And of course, the last part of the four major aspects of theory of instruction is reinforcement wherein rewards and punishments must be well selected for a very productive teaching and learning process. And they must, of course, be placed properly. Is it applicable for the before instruction or is it uh, applicable during your instruction or even after instruction? Share Subscribe Jesus. Subscribe, share, share. share. Go, go, go.